Today's episode is brought to you by We Break You Buy. Interested in sports cards and memorabilia? Check out We Break You Buy on TikTok. We Break You Buy is a small operation run by three brothers, offering spots for a chance at winning some incredible sports cards and memorabilia. That's We Break You Buy. Check it out today on TikTok. host Patrick Darms and I'm your co-host Anton Paras and we have a veteran guest returning to the podcast Paul Kind welcome back welcome back Paul thank you very much guys and thanks for the invite of course this is another anniversary film Paul this should make you feel old this is the 40th anniversary of Star Trek 3 the search for Spock god I really do feel old considering um I was what would it have been uh, oh god uh 14 15 by that point no, 17. Oh my God, I would have been really old. <laughs> 40 years. We're doing a number of um, films in the coming months mm-hmm. that came out in 1984. This is, I think, the first of several we're going to be doing, Anton. Uh, we're going to be doing Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. All right. Uh, yeah, a little passage to India action. It's uh, and, and, and there's going to be a bit of an uneven quality in terms of these films from 1984, but always a fun journey as we dissect and walk through each yeah, of these films. Definitely. Paul, would you say that you're a Star Trek fan? I would say I was a massive fan of the original TV series because essentially a bit like the Owen Allen TV series on, for children, I was a big Star Trek fan. So every... I think it would have been a Tuesday night at 7.30, Star Trek would be on, and it was just such a fantastic series, and it was an endearing part of my childhood. And then there was just this huge gap between the end of those that series uh, being repeated on TV to then the build-up to the to the motion picture. Um, so I was really excited about the motion picture. You know, we kind of touched on it before the podcast. I was, like, really excited and then hugely disappointed by what they presented because it was very stylistically it was very different from the tv series but it had all the main characters which was a big plus and i think as the as they made more of these films i felt like they kind of got sort of their pitch right and it got more and more like the tv series so yeah i do like it i love Mm -hmm. the fact that it focuses on uh friendship camaraderie um trying to do the best you can you know, you can for your fellow people and for people that you don't necessarily agree with. It had a very positive spirit, which I think is pretty unique for a sci-fi series like that. Everything else tends to be a little bit more greyer, but I've always enjoyed it. So, yeah, all in all essence, I would say I was a Star Trek fan. As the series went on into Deep Space Nine and all those others, I kind of sort of faded away, I have to say. How about Next Generation? Did you like that one? I did at the beginning, yeah. I just, I just, in the end, I think it was, I was probably getting into my 20s then. And so just the sheer volume of episodes, just like I just couldn't keep up because there was other things in my life I kind of wanted to do. So I saw f- probably the first and second series, but after that, I lost, uh, I kind of lost track of it all. I kind of spun back a little bit with Voyager. I uh, quite enjoyed that. Mm. Uh, but then none of the others I've, I've picked up at all. Well, the newest version of Star Trek is very uneven. Strange New Worlds. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a little bit of that. It's okay. Um, I thought Discovery got off to a good start, and then the second season turned into just just a pile of garbage. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a uh, it's tough too because I think there was definitely a shift once it went from broadcast to Star Trek becoming a streaming only series. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I watched the original series with my dad when I was a kid, and I was sometimes bored by it, sometimes excited by it. I thought the original films when I saw them as a kid were pretty boring. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this on the motion picture episode, Anton, how I 
got into these films and the show much later in life, not until I was in my like late twenties. So I guess the the complete opposite of Paul in that regards. But I've I've seen Next Generation all the way through. I've seen mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine all the way through, and I'm quite fond of these original films although you know we've touched on this before the qu- the quality of them is is not equal yeah it's uneven some might even say an odd number film oh, i'm glad you brought that up because we're going to explore that theory paul i'm sure you've heard this theory that the odd number trek films are the bad ones and that the even numbered are the good ones yeah i i i've, I've definitely heard it and I, in some respects i kind of agree although this one um yeah no, actually, I, I kind of agree with it, but I suppose it's, it's what, what you're kind of into, really, um, in terms of stories and things like that. But uh, I think some of them are, are better than others. Yeah. A lot of people like you don't like the motion picture. I'm quite fond of it. I think it mm-hmm. has retroactively become a film that I enjoy just because of how much of an outlier it is. I, I I really respect how completely disconnected and different it is from the rest of these films because starting with Wrath of Khan all the way up to Undiscovered Country, these films all have a very similar look and feel and tone. They're all wearing these thick red sweaters and... Motion picture is just completely different. It looks like they're at a dentist disco convention. Right. And I mean, we, we uh, definitely a uh, fun thing for the listeners. Go back and check out that episode. If you'd like to hear all about um, the thoughts that I have and Pat have on Star Trek, the motion picture, but definitely fair to say they invested a lot in the special effects in that film. They did. It's definitely boring. I, I will concede that, but I find it interesting to watch. I, as someone who would have been, I guess, 14 at the time, it did test my patience somewhat. I think I was because I was expecting something just full of action with a with the whole you know group of character cast from the original series, and yet right. for, it seemed like for hours we were just journeying onward ever onward yeah i mean that film had an enormous budget for its time it was one of the most expensive films ever made when it came out in 1979 it made money but not nearly as much as paramount had hoped for they basically scaled things down for the second film wrath of khan they had a greatly reduced budget and it paid off tremendously because that is almost universally considered the greatest film in the series i think all three of us would probably agree with that it Mm. is certainly a film that i would give an a rating to it i think it's wonderful definitely agree and that started a trend which we you know we mentioned it in that episode where they were in cost saving mode basically for the rest of the duration of the original uh, run of films including this one which we're um going to get into now but before we do paul as always is there anything you'd like to plug or promote uh no not today. I'm plug free. Thank you very much for the That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will remember for next time if I'm invited. Yep. There we go. Oh, of course. We'll have you back. We need somebody to talk about on uh, <laughs> the final frontier. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to it. Uh, okay, so Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. In the second part of the unofficial trilogy that began in Wrath of Khan, Admiral James T. Kirk has defeated his arch, arch enemy, but at great cost. His friend Spock has apparently been killed, the USS Enterprise is being scrapped, and starship physician Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy has taken ill. McCoy's odd behavior is evidence that he's harboring Spock's katra, or spirit, and Kirk seeks to take the Enterprise back to the Genesis planet to find his friend's body. Rebuffed, Kirk takes dramatic action that results in war with Klingons. Star Trek III was released on June 1st, 1984 by Paramount Pictures, directed by Leonard Nimoy, screenplay by Harv Bennett, starring William Shatner, DeForest Kelly, James Doohan, George Takei, Walter Koenig, Michelle Nichols, Merritt Buttrick, Christopher Lloyd, and Leonard Nimoy. The budget was $16 million, that is $47 million adjusted for inflation, and the box office was $87 million, that is $257 million adjusted for 
inflation. So, Paul, we talked about how you were a Star Trek fan, but why this one? Why Star Trek 3? I think it was because, like you said earlier, Star Trek, the slow motion, came out in, what's 1979? Then we had The Wrath of Khan, which was just so fantastic, and it was like, this is what I kind of came to the cinema to see. And then, all of a sudden, you know, there was the shock of, obviously, Spock dying. And it's like, okay. And I think at the time, there was a lot of um, kind of news around whether Leonard McCoy really, so uh, Leonard Nimoy wanted to be part of the Star, Star Trek franchise going. And so his death, in a way, wasn't necessarily a surprise. But then all of a sudden, it was announced that, yep, there's another Star Trek film. So based on the kind of goodwill of Wrath of Khan, um, I was really looking forward to uh, the search for Spock. But when I actually saw it, it really wasn't quite the film I was hoping it would be. And I th- I think, you know, we'll probably, you know, talk about it through this podcast. But I think essentially, to me, it's still quite slow. There's not a lot of things that are going on. And it just still, it lacked that lovely storytelling that was all part of Wrath of Khan. And I think something was definitely missing with the search for Spock. Well, you weren't the only one that that felt that way because we teased this earlier. This is an odd-numbered Trek film. There is criticism lobbied towards it. You just pointed out some of the perceived flaws with it. This is a film in the series that really has a lot of fans. You can find a lot of people that are fond of this film, but there's also a lot of people that find it boring and cheap looking and sort of filler. And I think it's going to be interesting to explore it because this is always something that I've believed that when you're always ranking like great film trilogies, the Genesis trilogy in Star Trek never gets mentioned, and it really should. And I understand it's not an official trilogy, but I've always been quite fond of these three films in a row, Wrath of Khan, Search for Spock, and Voyage Home. I think they function quite well as like one long story, which I, I was trying to figure out. This These three films, they take place over what seems like a few days would you say? Mm. Or a couple of weeks? Very short period of time. Very close in continuity. I have just always enjoyed the, the, the continuity of these three films together. I think it's going to be interesting to discuss this one. Anton, what about you? Like, What are your initial like impressions of this film? First off by saying, if you hear anything rustling in the background, the dogs are being a little bit naughty, um, which uh, I think maybe they sense my energy of uh, first, you know, first impression of the film. I've seen this uh, I've seen this before, and I definitely say it has that TV movie energy. But at the same time, I totally agree with you, Pat. It's because of the continuity and its place in the story of the films that I think that it has a lot to bring. And I feel like in that, from like a Genesis trilogy perspective, it's a it feels like a a very nice continuity that continues the story in a very it, it feels natural and organic way and makes each film kind of have their its own distinct flavor but at the same time it's it's fair to say that uh the film is a bit uneven especially when you have such high expectations from such a strong predecessor i'm trying to put myself in your shoes paul of seeing wrath of khan and spock dying must have been quite a blow if you weren't ready for it now you may you you may have been because you knew about leonard nimoy's you know dissatisfaction with the series and like where his future was with it but if you were like a casual fan, a casual moviegoer, it must have been shocking in 1982. Oh, without a doubt, there's very few films that you can name where it would allow one of its key stars to die at the end of the movie without, in theory, any possible return, especially on something like a, a franchise as strong as this. So, yeah, it was, was quite the shock. And then, of course, they decided to do what most film franchises do, which is... We bring killed someone, time to bring him back. This I film has a 78% Rotten Tomatoes score. So, not bad. Certainly not the lowest in the franchise. About the Rotten Tomatoes score is, I wonder if that's because people watch it the way you have, Patrick, in terms of Roth of Car and then Search for Spark and Voyage Home. Just as a collection, it's actually a p- pretty tight trilogy. But if you were to look at it, to me, if you look at it as a standalone, I think it's the weakest of the three for sure. I agree with that. It's, oh, totally. I mean, we'll, we'll get into it, but like that's, I don't think we're spoiling anything there. Like, th- th- it's certainly the weakest of the three films. But part of that is just because the second one and the fourth one are so good. But what I would say about that is the fact I think with Wrath of Khan, it was very different from the motion picture, and the Voyage Home was very different to all the others as well, where Search for Spock wasn't 
wasn't anything particularly new. It was basically going over all ground. So when you look at them in isolation, you can say that Rutherford Khan and Voyage Home are very distinct films that have a lovely timeline interplay. Search for Spock was just kind of teasing you along before you actually went to see Voyage Home. No, you're not wrong. I think we should get into the production history. Because this is this is really we're gonna we're gonna start to unwrap this. So immediately upon the release of Wrath of Khan in nineteen eighty two, Paramount recognized its success and they wanted to move forward with a sequel immediately. The only wrinkle was that Nicholas Meyer, who had directed Wrath of Khan, refused to return, having disagreed with the changes made to his film's ending without his approval. Upon seeing Wrath of Khan completed, Leonard Nimoy was, quote, excited about playing Spock again, end quote, and he told Paramount that he wanted to direct the sequel. Then studio head Michael Eisner initially did not want Nimoy directing because he mistakenly thought the actor hated Star Trek, but Nimoy was able to convince him otherwise. And quick sidebar, if you know your film studio history, this was less than a year before Michael Eisner would leave Paramount to become CEO of Disney. Upon hearing that Nimoy was helming the sequel, Gene Roddenberry's first reaction to the news was that producer Harv Bennett had, quote, hired a director you can't fire, end quote. We're trying to make a point of mentioning producers on this podcast, and this is a really good one, Anton. Harv Bennett was one of the principals behind Wrath of Khan. And he would go on to produce the next three Trek films. This one, Search for Spock, The Voyage Home, and The Final Frontier. He also wrote the screenplay. He began writing it the day after Wrath of Khan opened. And he noted that, quote, 17 other people could have written it, end quote, after the hints at Spock's resurrection in the previous film. Although he would receive sole writing credit, Bennett worked very closely with Nimoy on the writing process. They focused on the open thread of Spock mind-melding with McCoy at the end of Wrath of Khan as a way to explain Spock's restoration. Now, the idea of the the Vulcan Katra came from Bennett's discussions with Nimoy. The actor referred the producer to an episode of the original series, Amok Time, that suggested to Bennett a high level of spiritual transference amongst the Vulcans. Bennett admitted that the idea of Kirk and company going back to the Genesis planet to recover Kirk's noble self stemmed from a poem he read in a Star Trek fan magazine. Nimoy and the rest of the production admitted that they had to consider the enormous expectations from fans. Not resurrecting Spock would have been poorly received. Bennett initially struggled with trying to write the script in a way that would allow viewers to absorb the story without having seen the previous film. He added a previously in Star Trek film device and he had Kirk narrate a captain's log describing the sense of loss not wanting the story to be too predictable bennett decided to destroy the enterprise intending for this to be kept secret until the film's release nimoy wanted the film to be operatic which well with emphasis on the characters and their emotions bennett started writing the script with the ending where spock says your name is jim and worked backwards from that point originally the romulans were the villains But Nimoy had this change to Klingons, who he felt were more theatrical. Bennett took only six weeks to complete the script, and the approved budget was $16 million, so slightly more than Wrath of Khan, but significantly less than the motion picture. Actually, 200% less. This had... This budget was only one-third of the motion picture. Almost the entire cast from the previous film returned. Kirstie Alley was the exception. Her salary demands were too high, and she was replaced by Robin Curtis. Pretty bold move on her part, considering that was her feature film debut, and she asked for way too much money, and they were like, see you later. Edward James Almos was Nimoy's original choice for the role of Krug. However, producer Harv Bennett preferred Christopher Lloyd, and Nimoy finally cast Lloyd because he came off more operatic and physically intimidating. To save money, many of the sets, particularly interiors, were redresses of existing sets. The Enterprise Bridge was reconfigured to stand in for the Grissom, with the chairs reupholstered and the central navigation console rotated to modify the floor plan. An Earth Bar and the Klingon Medical Bay were redresses of the Enterprise Sick Bay. Nimoy even appropriated the Klingon Bridge set from another production. Paramount took great security lanes to ensure the story's surprises remained secret, despite the precautions word on the Enterprise's destruction leaked out before the film's release. Principal photography commenced on August 15, 1983. So director of photography Charles Carell was unhappy that every scene except one was filmed on a soundstage, feeling that recreating everything on set resulted in a fake look. 
The cinematographer suggested that Genesis be filmed on Kauai in Hawaii and that Red Rock Canyon stand in for Vulcan. The production did not have the money to shoot on location, meaning that Nimoy was preoccupied when making sure the various outdoor settings felt believable. The Vulcan stairs were filmed at Austin College, the production's only location shooting. Production on the film was temporarily shut down after a fire destroyed several sound stages at Paramount Studios, one of which was adjacent to the set for the Genesis planet. Initially, the set's pyrotechnics were suspected of causing the fire, but the cause is ruled to be an arson. So William Shatner helped fight that fire. Definitely a hero. Carell hoped that the place would, be, would burn down so that he would get his chance to film in Hawaii. And Industrial Light and Magic, of course, provided the special effects for the film. Although Industrial Light and Magic had provided the effects work for The Wrath of Khan, they had only been approached after effects storyboards had been completed. For this film, ILM were brought in much earlier, meaning that the visual effects supervisor Ken Ralston and his team were involved from the beginning stages. So Nimoy credited this early involvement with increasing the amount of creative input into the film's de- the film's design and execution. The Excelsior was a new design that Industrial Light and Magic felt was a better rendition of a Federation starship, sleeker and more modern than the Enterprise. The Excelsior was supposed to debut in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and be identified as newly promoted Captain Sulu's first command. This plot line was dropped and the Excelsior was saved for this film. Sulu finally took command of his own ship in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Composer James Horner returned to score The Search for Spock, unfilling, fulfilling a promise he had made to Bennett on The Wrath of Khan. Nimoy wanted to use his friend Leonard Rosenman to s- compose the score and had to be persuaded to use Horner. Rosenman gave us the horrific music to the 1978 animated Lord of the Rings film. Awful. He would- he would end up scoring the voyage home. Wow, that gave me some flashbacks. Ugh, just ugh. In hours-long discussions with Bennett and Nimoy, Horner agreed with the director that the, quote, romantic and more sensitive, end quote, cues were more important than the, quote, bombastic ones. So Paramount considered releasing this film in 3D. Instead, the studio decided that 3D was better suited for Friday the 13th, part three. D. <laughs> this ended up making $76 million in North America and only about $11 million overseas. So that's a pretty strange ratio. And, and, and Paul, question for you. Was this a big deal in the UK at the time? I would say so because it's like your kind of summer blockbuster. I, I'm really surprised about the overseas numbers and I, I don't know whether it's down to other releases in 84. I'm trying to think what they would be, whether the Indiana yeah, you Jones. You would have had like Indiana that. Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> Ghostbusters, Beverly Hills Cop, yeah. Gremlins. Yeah. Big yeah, movies. Yeah, yeah. It was quite the year, really. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I'm, still surpri- I'm still surprised because, again, at the end of the day, it wasn't that far behind uh, The Wrath of Khan, so the momentum would have still been around for that film, especially The Goodwill. So, yeah, to, to make such so little, I don't know, what would that be in today's money, do you think? $11 million back then, probably like $40 million oh, yeah. now. Yeah, it was like four times. Wow. Yeah, about. Not a lot, is yeah. it? Yeah, I, I, it really stood out to me because, you know, normally when, even back then, there was less of an emphasis on the international box office. They always, studios were really focused on North America back then, uh, you know, less so than they are now. But usually the ratio was more even than that but uh. true you also have to remember that we had to wait till you guys had seen the film so the so the film cans could be shipped over to the uk Uh, so there was always a there was always a big delay so i don't know whether the sort of i don't know some of the negativity of the film i don't know might translate it i can't really put my finger on it it could have been yeah i'm one i'm i'm thinking this probably didn't come out in the uk till like august or september yeah there was always a big delay unfortunately it's all changed now obviously with digital cinema right well that's the production history for star trek 3 it's time to talk about why wasn't it better we hinted at this earlier. Number one, we're going to start with the production. They had a limited budget. You can really tell they were being asked to squeeze every dollar out of it. Anton, you mentioned this feels like a TV movie. I completely agree with you. The, the cinematography and the overall production, it's a step down from Wrath of Khan. If you didn't know any better, you would think you're watching a TV movie. I, I mean, ironic because, you know, we, we chatted about this before the recording. This is a cast you know, from TV translated into the big screen. And I mean, it, it felt natural, but at the same time did draw out a strong performance. But from, it, it definitely felt like a step down from Rathacon. And it's curious 
because it's not the same DP, but it's a lot of the same crew. I don't quite know why this is. I think there's a couple different things you could probably focus on. The DP, Charles Carell, nothing against him, but I do see a lot of TV stuff on his CV. I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it helped that they weren't given the money to do any location shooting whatsoever. When your DP hopes that the sets burn down so that he can film on location, kind of says it all, really. I mean interesting just to kind of even look to the future pretty big course correction in the next film right they had a much bigger budget for voyage home i don't know the exact number but i if i recall correctly they basically had double the budget and it showed that's a way better looking film than this now Carell, to, to defend him slightly you know we noted how unhappy he was filming everything on a sound stage i think look they probably did their best but despite their best efforts, like this is really one of the biggest weaknesses of the film. Nothing about it looks organic or real. The production design, e- equally cheap looking. You know, we talked about in, in, the, in the production history how they were constantly reusing and redressing sets to save money. It really does show. I mean, having just gotten back from Disney World, it really looks like a lot of this film was shot on like the set of Epcot. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I think the one of the scenes that looked really dated to me was even when Christopher Lloyd fired on the uh, f- fired on the the Klingon on the ship that didn't follow orders. He wanted prisoners, right? So then he took out the Klingon, and the way he just dissipates. Yes, that felt really outdated. A lot of the effects feel dated, right? I, I was kind of shocked at it actually like this a lot of the ship effects and the stuff on the genesis planet it looked like something from the original series now that's fine when you're watching a tv episode but it's not acceptable when you're watching a movie really like the hd is right. not kind to this film at all it is not it was it wasn't kind to the effects it also wasn't kind to <laughs> the very out of place space coyote thing muppet <laughs> that they had the stuffed animal dog that Christopher Lloyd's character was carrying around. Yeah, that that, that thing had its own character arc through the film. <laughs> Just to add to it, I think um, certainly the, the the big scene at the end when you know Spock is being rebooted, the set just looked so bare, and you got no sense of scale. And it, you know, to your point. Uh, it just looked like something I would have expected from the original TV series. They kind of seemed to run out of props. Everything looked so bare and flat. And, you know, you kind of expect a lot more from something that's, you know, on 35 mil and presented in a, in a theatre. It just looked cheap and there wasn't really much to see. And you expect this kind of expanded universe. And it really was very limited. And it's just curious because I, you did not get that impression on the wrath of khan i think they were far they did a better job of disguising like things like the lighting you know you think about like the lighting on the genesis planet everything just felt very artificial again i'm gonna i'm gonna use the epcot reference it really did look like you were going through like spaceship earth at epcot it's pretty great (laughs) and it feels and not in a good way right (laughs) no the creature effects we mentioned a little puppet that christopher lloyd's character is carrying around I actually felt the worm creatures on the planet were pretty well done. Mm -hmm. And then we have the aliens that Bones meets in the bar. The makeup looks like a Halloween mask. It's not good. Yeah, it was a little... We talked about the unevenness. It's uh, that's where it felt a little campy. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it it might as well have been an episode of like the next generation, which again, that was a big budget TV series. But the point is that was a TV series. But now what about the most important shot in the film? The destruction of the Enterprise. What do we think of that? Shots with the Enterprise in general, I thought looked really good. And in, in, in particular, that scene, very emotional scene, too. I thought it was a very memorable shot. They achieved that melting effect by they by coating the model in styrofoam when they blew it up. I, I do think it's effective. I think I read that they, the sh- you know, when the the bridge breaks up, that they tipped it upside down so that gravity would lift it because it was effectively falling. But you reverse the, you know, you turn the camera upside down, so it looks like it's just going upwards. I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. And probably the best effect out of the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. It was so good, I like rewound it and watched it a couple of times. But I think that's the joy. They got of, that right. Yeah, yeah that's I think fair. It's probably, probably the joy of a good practical effect where computer technology still wasn't 100% there. No. 
for sure. And it's interesting. Um, I didn't even know this until I was doing the research for this one, but Wrath of Khan has the first or one of the very first CGI shots in any film with the formation of the Genesis planet. Pretty cool. Uh, that is really cool. This film also kind of gave us like the modern idea of the Klingons. Now, we, we get a very brief look at the Klingons in the motion picture, but when you think of Klingons, you this is really the film that really introduced us to them, you know, because they look very different on the original series. Right, and then... This is, of course, like you said, influential of the especially use of the the birds of prey, the language, a lot of uh, the symbolism that we typically see with Klingons. Yeah, the 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 concept of like honor and everything. I, and I think this was the first film that really featured their language spoken extensively. I'm trying to remember. Do you hear Klingon in the original series? You might. No, I think they spoke English. I think it wasn't until Star Trek, the motion picture, there was a few words in that. There is a there is a documentary I think you can get on YouTube where the guy talks about how he created the language. And the only words he had were maybe one or two words in the original series, but they were generally names. And then in the motion right. picture, there was three or four bits of dialogue that they translated on the screen that's all he had to go by and then he basically built a whole new language out of that which is pretty impressive i can't think of the guy's name anton but we of course talked about him when we did the uh, atlantis the lost empire recording which is uh paul that is a disney film animated film that we covered recently so they basically disney hired this guy who created the klingon language to create the atlantean language for that film wow yeah. So a few a few fun facts. Um, James Doohan came up with the first Klingon words for the 1979 film. So that was the first documented Whoa. usage of Klingon from our very own Scotty. But the good old but, James Doohan. But you're right, Pat. Uh, it was Mark Okrand, linguist, who came up with a full with a more full language in 1984 for this film, The Search for Spock. Yeah, it's really cool. Like th- this is the modern Klingons that we have today came from this film. All right, I feel like we've been pretty harsh on the production. It's time to talk about some good parts of it. What's not poor quality? That James Horner score. It's wonderful. It really drives the film. It's one of my favorite things about the film. It's every bit as good of his work on Wrath of Khan. It's one of my favorite James Horner scores. No, totally agree. I mean, you're not uh, you're not wrong, Pat. I think um, one definitely one of the highlights in the film. I think it's about the only really broad operatic expression in that film really was the music everything else as you know you both have said is it's got a very tv style to it whereas the the music i think brought it into that cinematic sphere it's one of the best examples of how a score can really elevate a film where where maybe the production quality suffers in other areas this film is elevated by what horner does here yeah you know just to kind of comment on that a bit more there are a few scenes where we get intimate shots of characters and pretty pivotal moments, whether it was, um, you know, Spock's dad and, and, and Kirk or um, not Kirstie Alley on the planet with uh, no soul Spock. <laughs> it could have come off as much more campy, but because I think the, the score really did help kind of give more of those scenes a lot more weight. 100%. And the action scenes, too really elevate like when kirk makes the decision to blow up the enterprise the the score starts with this this percussive thing and it keeps building up and building up until the ship explodes and it's just great stuff yeah it's it lends itself to building the tension of the scene and then just intensifies the emotion of the scene you can tell he took a couple of cues on aliens from this score yeah don't get me wrong i love james horner but he was regularly borrowing from his own scores Mm -hmm. if you listen to his scores for like patriot games or clear and present danger there's just entire sections of the score that are just from aliens you know a little little, maybe a little lazy but the highs with james horner are so high that i don't care i'm willing to forgive it james horner or r.i.p as much as i love the jerry goldsmith score to the first film which anton we we sang it sang our praises on that episode um yes. it really is one of the all-time great film scores as much as i love it i am so glad we got young james horner for these two films right like the oh, whole reason he ended up working on them is because of the constrained budgets harv bennett actually admitted that they ended up choosing horner for the second film because they couldn't afford jerry goldsmith i mean it's a, a, again like 
Goldsmith score, how iconic is that, right? I mean, it's still still to this day, I feel like there's a lot of Star Trek appearances where it's not even the right cast, but they still play that score. Yeah. But at the same time, totally agree. I feel like this film and have to give James Horner his flowers. Yeah, he would have been about 30 when he did this. You know, Didn't have a lot of stuff under his belt at this point. He was pretty new to film. Kind of like when we talked about the Poseidon Adventure with you, Paul. And like, well, they got like young John Williams, just one of the highlights of the film. Similar story here, right? It's like, yeah. oh, young James Horner. And proved to be quite quite the right choice for the film. And, I, you know, like you say, he's done some great film scores going going from Search for Spock and beyond that are so distinctive and always seems to add to any film that his scores are in, and I love it. And uh, we'll continue to enjoy it in future years. Next reason why this wasn't better, the story. This film does suffer in part because they just had this difficult task, right? They had to follow up what is universally considered the best film in the series. The chances of this being equal to or better than Wrath of Khan were basically impossible. And this is something that a lot of third films and franchises almost always struggle with. It's also very closely tied to the Wrath of Khan, maybe too closely. Anton, when we talked about Quantum of Solace... Or if we were going to talk about something like Back to the Future Part 3 or when we did Pirates of the Caribbean World's End, this film is resolving a lot of plot points that are left open from its predecessor. It doesn't really have its own story. Kirk's son is killed, the Genesis device and the Enterprise are destroyed, and then they resurrect Spock. That's it. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, it's a simple story. That's fair. There's no, um, it, it, it's not like a, an existential question of, a, of life. It's not trying to save an entire race, but still a very compelling contained story that I think, uh, especially when you think of a lot of attachment to this crew, I think very, even just for this particular film, I think it is a very compelling story because of how much it's about like this crew and their, and, and their love for their, you know, crewmate and Spock. I'm going to take a slightly different slant on this. I'd actually say, look, you've spent and built all of this story in Wrath of Khan, and then you've basically used an entire film to basically go back and remove all of those elements. Like you say, the Genesis planet gets destroyed. You return Spock. David dies after him big, you know, father and son coming together. And he managed to save the Enterprise and this fawn is destroyed. I just don't think it's... It's nothing new. There's nothing new there. When you look at it in isolation, you just go, well, all it's really done is set up the fact that they've got the bird of prey with the cloaking device that services Voyage Home. Above and beyond that, I don't think it adds anything. And it does suffer from the fact also it doesn't have Spock until the very end. And to be honest, very little dialogue. And Mm -hmm. uh, Nichelle Nichols is barely in it. So, So, and even Scotty isn't really in it. So the dynamics are really reduced to very much two to three people. So to me, it's it's a bit of an outlier in terms of of a story because it just sucks so much from the the previous film to get you to a position to set up for for the next one. Whereas I think it could have gone beyond that particular story and done something else to get the bird of prey no i i see where you're coming from paul i think um my may i guess my thoughts with that is we have to remember nimoy's vision for the film was much more operatic and and from that sense i felt like it was trying to push more so the relationships of the crew versus anything quite so large or bombastic that we had from the previous film i felt like maybe this was trying to get a bit more grounded in being able to navigate the relationships of the crewmates and trying to you know save Spock. Not to say that uh, I I, I do agree with you. I feel like taking out elements that were core to the previous film probably just felt dismissive almost. I do agree with you, Paul, that this film suffers on its own if you watch it on its own. Every time I watch this film, I watch it back to back with Wrath of Khan. There's no possibility of me ever watching this just by itself. So I I can understand where you're coming from. I choose to look at this as like one long film. Yeah, I was about to say, I think that's the way you have to view this This as part of the Wrath of Khan. Otherwise, a lot of the key elements in the second, you know, in Search for Spock just doesn't really 
carried the emotional weight that it would have done if it had been like a standalone movie. There is a huge emotional gut punch in here, though, which we'll get to. Unlike Quantum of Solace, though, I don't feel that this is superfluous. Anton, that's where I agree with you. I think this story's continuation from Wrath of Khan into the into Voyage Home is very compelling. And although I do think it is the weakest of the three, there's no way I would ever skip it when I'm watching these films. But I, I I will concede, like if you're if you were trying to get a casual moviegoer into this film, you could never really recommend that they watch it on its own, right? To to maximize this one story, you you pretty much have to watch it back to back with Wrath of Khan. Even then, when you think of if one thinks of the stakes of Wrath of Khan turning into the stakes of Search for Spock, well, sure they're reduced. I feel like there's much less. I feel like the stakes are much lower. But then again, there's a bit of course correction in the next film of well, this is huge implications in terms of the impact in the storyline. So I think that, yeah, it was very intentional. I, my, from my perspective, very intentional from Leonard Nimoy on direction of where to go with the story here. And the title is not misleading. This this literally <laughs> is the search for Spock. Right. <laughs> you can't fault them for that. No, they really deliver on that. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. I, I really found it cool how this film story is the opposite of that. Kirk and the rest of the crew, they go to unbelievable lengths to bring back one individual. Yeah, they essentially give up their careers. But I do know what you mean about the stakes, right? It, they are low, at least in this film, like Spock died at the end of the second film, right? Nope, we can just bring him back because Katra. But then, to your point, Anton, a couple films later, the significance of the events in this film will resurface when we get all the way to uh, Star Trek VI. Is that what you were thinking of, by the way? I, I don't even know yeah. if you were, but... Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do understand the, the criticism about that, though. It's like the stakes are low. Other than the death of David, which is mm -hmm. devastating for Kirk, they just do resurrect Spock with seemingly little consequence, at least in the moment. All right, speaking of that, it's time to talk about this. Was Spock's death supposed to be permanent? Ooh, I think uh, I remember even watching Wrath of Khan for the first time, thinking how controversial of a decision that was. But I'm a, this is going to sound funny, I'm a comic book reader, and I feel like deaths are never, in fiction, are never quite so concrete. So I had a feeling like, well, this is science fiction, I could feel like he'd be coming back. But I wasn't sure, until I saw this film, if, if it was something that was going to happen. Because it was a very controversial decision. Based on what we know, it seems like if the, if Wrath of Khan had not been well received, I don't know if Nimoy would have returned. I have but to. they do tease it, right? The mind meld with bones, <laughs> the shot of his casket landing on the planet. Like they, it, it seemed like they were going to bring him back. I mean, we, we, we're obviously talking forty odd years ago, so and I, you know, right. I, I'm stretching my memory cells here. But like I said earlier, I didn't think I thought it was his way out of the franchise. That's why it was there, and he didn't want to carry on. And that was my understanding from that point. And then, for whatever reason, which I didn't know at the time, you know, they decided that actually he wanted to come back. He did enjoy it. Um, and there was nothing in his contract, apparently, to say that he would die in the Wrath of Khan. So I, I don't really know. But I just, I just from what I remember, I just felt that there was such a lot of... Because I thought there was a dynamic between him and uh, William Shatner as well, which they had a very kind of up and down relationship. I'm not oh, sure. That's Shatner that. for you. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder if that had an influence in sort of, you know, I came back, you guys, I did what you need to do, but just basically write me out. And then all of a sudden, it's probably like, well, that was really well received and, you know, pushed his luck and said, can I direct as well? And they were like, yeah, OK. And it's like, well, why not? I'm sure there's a way, like you say, Anton, there's always a way. Yeah. I feel like I'm trying to think, too, of other films where there have been controversial deaths in a franchise that either people didn't see coming or just it, it was bold for it to happen in the in the in the series i mean this is going to sound silly but i always felt like han's death in fast and the furious wasn't one that i was seeing coming well they brought him back years later right he died i'm trying to think who else i mean uh cyclops and x-men sure pretty pretty major character and then just boom gone oh just wait till we get to that turd <laughs> What a, what a terrible movie. Yeah, not wrong. That movie, 
That that's a oh that's an even better discussion. It's like how many movies are so bad that they actually retcon the entire movie and they're like that just never happened. Well, it was, it was that one, and then apparently the whole <laughs> X Men franchise because apparently that's what's going to happen with Deadpool. They're oh, like, oh, oh, they're like, well, let's just trash this. De- Deadpool's the big reset. Sounds wonderful. This film is the shortest Trek film. It's 105 minutes. I think it's generally paced well. But I, on the latest rewatch, I do think it does move a little snow, slow when they get to Genesis. When there's like the fake snow that they're going through and everything. Yeah, and they was, find like child Spock. Yeah, it's a little I, slow. I would definitely agree with you. I think um, even the beginning, actually, I think, you know, the fact that they had to basically give you a bit of prelogue of, of a, uh, you know, a summarization of the previous film, which I think could have been done better with us learning over time if, if people hadn't seen the film before, the previous film. And the end with resurrecting Spock, I think it was about seven minutes or something like that, and nothing really happened apart from drums being It takes a while. And, uh, and it just takes... Just the, it just kills the pace of the film for actually what turned out to be quite a nice little payoff and it's a, you know little scenes at the end but it was a long thing to expose us to just to get to that point um and yeah the scenes with on the planet as well the slowly maturing and things that just grind somewhat so i think a little bit of judicious editing would have helped and then of course the final fight Ugh, very... which you know results in kirk kicking krug off the cliff which is it's it just looks awful very anticlimactic fight yeah it, it looks like stop motion in certain shots, it's well, not great. I don't know. Do you see that flip that uh, that uh, um, Kirk did? <laughs> yes, yes. Which he definitely did not do. Which uh, yes, the the obvious stunt double. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of the you can tell they they didn't invest a lot of money in fight choreography. I'll just do a flip. Shatner's like, let me try this. They're like, no. <laughs> I don't need a stunt double for this. All right, it's time to talk about the death of David. I always forget how quickly and abruptly it happens. It it just there's no slow motion, there's no monologue, there's no there's no melodrama at all. It's just brief scuffle, knife to the chest, dead. I was watching this recently with um a couple people who had never seen this film before. They were genuinely shocked. Yeah. Especially with his character being introduced in the film. It was very another shocking death. It it really is. It's one of the most effective film deaths I can think of. You you really just don't think it's gonna happen. And what helped increase the weight of the scene? The score. Yes. Yes. Hundred percent. And I do I do want to give credit to Nimoy here for not going <laughs> into any melodrama territory when krug just says like kill one of the prisoners i don't care which it's just like within less than 10 seconds he's dead you're like wait what did they really just do that yeah they did I- like you really wish kirk had a- another moment to reflect on him right it- it's it's mm-hmm. the the real is it's the kobayashi maru story for kirk right the-, the realization that there is no way to save everyone and you're gonna lose at some point and credit to shatner very very emotional scene he's great in that scene it's probably one of his best better best ever scenes to be honest because he has to flip from that oh, yeah. shock of seeing his son die to then figuring out okay how can we double cross these you know the klingons in um in swap swapping the ship over you know and just the way you could see how his mind was you know still shocked but kind of planning in his head and to express that all it was just it was just fantastic i really enjoyed that bit you feel absolutely crushed for him especially when um not christy not kirsty alley yeah. tells him over the radio she's just like she's like captain david is dead you're like whoa i agree with you paul like it's really good stuff from him and this is um you could just show this clip to anyone who says shatner can't act he, he can act maybe he isn't the most consistent actor but his acting in this entire film i think is brilliant I love the idea of Nimoy directing him behind the ca- behind the camera. Um, when he stumbles, you know, to try to get back into his chair, that was an improvisation by Shatner. You know, um, Nimoy told him to do whatever he wanted to do, like react however you want, and that was that was Shatner's. Um, that was just how Shatner chose to play it. It, 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 it. It's real good stuff. So I recently read the novelization. Anton, you know how I feel about my novelizations. Oh yes, the man has a library. Yeah. Really worth reading if you're a Trek fan. If you're and if you're a, if you're at all a fan of this film, it is written by 
uh, Vonda McIntyre, and it's a really great novelization. There's a bunch of stuff in the novelization that is not in this film. There's about 80 pages of material in the story before this film even starts. David Marcus, who is um, uh, um, Kirk's son and not Kirstie Alley, they become romantically involved. Her character's name is Savik, by the way. But there's a lot of stuff about the Genesis device and how they're, you know, they're exploring the planet and trying to figure it out. There's more stuff um, with Christopher Lloyd's character, Krug. Really good novelization. I, I recommend it. And then uh, a pretty big, uh, you know, something something big that I remember reading was the reason they didn't actually have not Kirstie, uh, Kirstie Alley ending up together with... Uh, with um, you know, David's character was because there was a lot of editors banking on non Kirstie Alley and her romance with adolescent no soul Spock and how, how that would be received by audiences. Right. That's slightly creepy. Yeah. <laughs> that very, I felt awkward scene. Yeah. Panther. Time for a bit of Panther with my fingers. <laughs> also, I didn't realize this, and, uh, and I was like thinking about you know watching this back to back with Ratha Khan. Like, why is Carol Marcus not in this film at all? She's in the novelization. She's like a pretty important character in Ratha Khan. David's mother, just like not in here at all. It's, it, it is a major gap in in the continuity of the two stories for sure, and I've not seen any explanation yeah. as to why she wasn't included. Whether that was to just keep the plot moving along. Um, but I also thought they might have included a little bit more sort of Kirk and his son time, but that didn't kind of really happen. But then I suppose, no. the, I suppose the timelines were, were pretty short, as, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, is the gaps between all three films are pretty narrow. So maybe just there wasn't time was to kind of develop say, that story. I was going to say, uh, we could also chalk it up to Nimoy forgot. <laughs> he may have. Or they wanted to save money, and they're like, well, we can't afford her salary. Cut her. What do we think of Christopher Lloyd as Krug? I thought he did a great job. I mean, like him. Hard to hard to compare to uh, Mister Fantasy Island, but I thought he did a really good job. <laughs> I like him as the villain. I think he does a good job of acting through the makeup. Anton, to your point, he is no Ricardo Montalban, but I think he did a good job here. Nimoy wisely chose to not try and outdo Khan. They just made his character here a like villain, you know, TV movie villain of the week so to speak. They really found the perfect act actor to match Shatner's hamminess. I really appreciate how much of a dick he is. He's just a dick to be a dick. He doesn't really have any motive. He has no personal motivation against any of the characters. Also, just kind of fun to see Christopher Lloyd in a role like this. I don't think he's he, he's not often a lead, let alone a, 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 a villainous lead. So No, um, you're right. This would have been before he was Doc Brown. Right. And so... Even then, I, it, it was referenced in the notes, but I remember him just for his appearance from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Very, His expressions really sell it, and I could see why he fit very well in the role. Relish and mustard. He is delivering all his lines with that. There we go. <laughs> I like when he, what is it? at one point, he's just like, Captain Kirk, this is your opponent speaking. It's like the most blatant in your face. I just like how he doesn't have any backstory. I think it's a good thing. Like he, he, he has, he has no motivation. He has no um, personal vendetta against Kirk or anything like that. He's just a nope. random Klingon who wants his, who wants the Genesis device. That's it. Very simple. Yeah. Doesn't never face to face with Kirk, but ready to ready to catch hands as soon as they're both on Genesis. He had one of the best lines, I think, which sort of characterized his affection for his crew when he's when the they beamed over to the Enterprise. They said, "Oh, there's just this voice on the computer," and he saw, "Let me hear," and it's going three, two, one, and he says, "Get out, get out of there!" And you can see the raw emotion of he knew his 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 team was going to get destroyed, and uh, I thought that was really good. Totally agree. Yeah, he's fun. He 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 had the right level of camp to match the rest of this film because this film is, I would say, eighty percent serious, twenty percent campy. So extra budget TV soap opera, pretty much. Yeah, you know, not all of the jokes land. You know, when um when they're stealing the Enterprise and Uhura tells that guy like, "This isn't reality. This is fantasy." It's like, eh, <laughs> maybe that was funny in nineteen eighty four. It's not funny in twenty twenty four, but 
you can forgive it. Again, I think one of the takeaways watching these films is they're all rated PG, right? Right. And it wasn't like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom where they were pushing the limits of PG. Like they, this was just a PG rated movie. Speaking of that scene, stealing the Enterprise, it's one of the best scenes in the series. I've watched that scene on YouTube, mm. I don't know, 25 times in my life, maybe more. If I see it pop up in the algorithm, I'm like, oh, cool. The Enterprise stealing. Yeah, it's uh, pretty awesome. I think this was also one of the scenes where I felt like the special effects were great just because of how great the Enterprise looked. And yeah, also just a lot of emotional weight to that scene. And they knew exactly what they were doing, but they were still going through with it. And very well paced scene. Ditto for the destruction of the Enterprise, right? Like it, 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 it was all about the chemistry with the characters, right? When Scotty and Chekhov realize what Kirk is doing and they just look at each other and they just go with it. That's great stuff. Oh, so well done. You can really tell these actors have been working with each other for years. Now, was that the most emotional scene or the death of Christopher Lloyd's wolf cat thing? <laughs> Oh, that poor stuffed animal, you mean? Are you sure it was a PG film? I mean, that's kids could be crying. Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, that's a that that that's gonna be uh, sticking with people's minds for a long time. Roger Ebert called this film a compromise between the tones of the first and second Star Trek films. I kind of agree with uh, that. Yeah, that's fair. I think they had, you know, they they very um, intelligently realized that they had struck gold with what they had done on Wrath of Khan, and they decided to, you know, keep riding that. At the same time, too, like Gef, I have to give credit to a focus on character. I'd say like focus on the the characters' relationships, and then also continuing to build the universe. They didn't have to have a full on Klingon language, but they did for the film. That's actually pretty cool. So they definitely made efforts to continue to expand oh, yeah. the universe. Yeah, look, the limited budget and the you know the crappy production design, like that, does not take away from the fact that this is a very well directed well acted well written film and i think those those three points are more than enough to make up for the cinematography right like i can forgive the tv quality cinematography when you get performances like we get in this film and speaking of the performances paul you mentioned how spock's absence means there's less characters to focus on i agree with you however i'm grateful for it because the outlier that that ends up giving us here DeForest Kelly gives the greatest performance of his career in this film. He gets a nice expanded role here. We get to see some really good acting from him where he's struggling with his own personality and Spock's Katra inside of him. Fantastic chemistry with Shatner. And it's, I think it's just, it, I really do think it's the best performance of his career. And it was really nice to see him get to shine in this role. I think you're totally right there. And I, it, 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 he, in all the films in the TV series, he doesn't necessarily, he's usually a foil with Spock. And so to get him to have these moments where, you know, he's trying to understand what's going on and what he needs to do, I thought were fantastic. And probably, you know, throughout this whole film, each of them had their own moments, I think, where their acting chops were weren't truly used. The chemistry between the characters is great. We get some proper, you know, Scenery chewing when Kirk kicks Krug off the mountain. I have had about enough of you. It's kind of funny. I mean, I, I, I think it's the, the backflip Shatner does. I think that's, I was like, that's not Shatner. <laughs> not Shatner. He's clearly landing on like a trampoline covered in sand. Great dialogue in this film too. After being denied to take the Enterprise out, they're like, what's the word, Admiral? And Kirk just says, the word is no. I am therefore going anyway. <laughs> I love the dialogue between him and Bones when he's like, my God, Bones, what have I done? And he says, what you had to do, what you always do, you turn death into a fighting chance to live. And then really the stuff with Kirk and Sarek, that's some of my favorite scenes in the film. When when Sarek first comes to Kirk's apartment and he tells him about like, you know, the Katra and, you know, Kirk's telling him like, you know, he, he made no request of me and he's like, he would have not have spoken of it openly. And it, it's a really good bit of acting from, I can't think of the guy's name, but the, uh, I'm blanking. The, the gentleman who plays Sarek. Mark Anton, Leonard. If you want to Google that. That's it. Mark Leonard. Thank you. It's just great because he's a character who can't, who doesn't show emotion but you see how like destroyed he is by the death of his son. And then at the end, when he says, Kirk, you know, I thank you. What you've done is, and Kirk says, what I have done, I had to do. And he asks, but at what cost? Your ship, your son. And Kirk says, if I hadn't tried, the cost would have been my soul. It's great writing. Yeah, pretty damn good writing. Yeah. Any additional thoughts? 
on this film before we start to wrap this up? I will say for a film that had a very a predecessor that has, is will often be voted as the number one Star Trek Star Trek film of all time, this film has a ton of heart. I'll give it that, and very impressive for Leonard Nimoy's first directorial film. He could do worse. True that. So we talked about the TV quality of the production. We talked about the story and how, you know, it it, it doesn't necessarily stand on its own very well. It's time to wrap it up. It's time to give our ratings. Paul, you're the guest. Would you like to go first? You don't have to go first, but we always offer. I I think I always go first. Um, Yeah, so if I was to rate it as a standalone, it wouldn't score highly, but as it's part of what I think, you know, as you say, Pat, it's a pretty nice trilogy. And I love the flow from The Wrath of Khan, uh, Search for Spark, uh, and uh, The Voyage Home. Sitting and watching it, to, you know, the last sort of three days, I really appreciated the, 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 the flow of those three films. So for me, it's a, it's a solid C. Okay. So you just, it's okay. It's okay. I, I, I didn't overly love it. I didn't ultimately dislike it. I thought it was, you know, the fact that it's, you know, the quotes that you you spoke about earlier, they're just fantastic, you know, and the scenes when his son dies and they have to destroy the ship, brilliant. And, you know, it's, it's a nice companion piece to the other two, two films. So I've got nothing really to dislike overly about that film, but... I couldn't say I'd ever go back to it unless I was going to watch all three again. It's not something I'd ever go back to. Anton, what do you think? So when we think of the film before it and the film after it, it's part of a larger complete story. It's, I'd say, a bit of a gamble for certain films to have film to have stories with such continuity through films. But after watching this and thinking more about it, I really do feel like th- this is such a good film and the fact that it was part of the continuation piece but it i think it does stand on its own you know pretty well not a perfect movie by any means but at the same time it was a bit of a course correction and when i think of the aspects that it focused on in the film that it particularly did very well was trying to drive the emotion uh, the emotion and the tension uh, between characters while focusing on a very simple plot which <laughs> like you said pat it was very on the nose it's the search for spock and I think like if you even think of it as a just standalone episode that just ended up being a movie, like I think it does a really good job in that sense. I found it very entertaining. Um, while it was not as complex as other, you know, as a storyline could be or not as nuanced, I still think that it had, you know, it has a lot of merit from that sense. At the end of the day, like I actually really, really enjoy this film. I think that that enjoyment comes from the heart of the film and the heart of the characters. It's a uh, it may it, it's not my favorite of the Star Trek films, but I actually do put this pretty highly. I put it at a B minus. All right, this is one of those examples where I really do encourage everyone to read the Roger Ebert review. It's a great read. He calls this film good, not great. I completely agree. Almost everything about this film is good despite the downgrade in production quality from the second film. There are parts of it that look like you are watching a TV movie. They had a limited budget and it shows. But Anton, I really liked how you phrased it. This this film does have a lot of heart. It is a very entertaining adventure story. It's got a good villain. It's got great performances. And it's got some of the most memorable moments in the entire Star Trek series. I very much enjoy it. I think it is a satisfying second part of the Genesis trilogy. And yes, it does suffer if you view it by itself. It functions much better when you view it as the second part in this trilogy. Its biggest flaw is that it's just not on the same tier as the two films that bookend it, nor Undiscovered Country. But it is well told, it is well acted, and for the most part, I think it is a well-executed second part of what what is this trilogy. It's called The Search for Spock. It is The Search for Spock. Anton, I'm right there with you, B-. minus. I swear, folks, we don't we don't go over our scores before the episodes. We don't. Promise. And that's it for Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Paul, it has been a pleasure as always. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, 
give me giving me the opportunity to relive my youth once more throughout the whole Star Trek uh, original cast. Thank you, Paul. It is always our pleasure, and believe me, um, we're 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 always the door is always open for you um, to join us and uh, to. Sp- to chat on more movies so we can't wait for you to return again soon thank you very much yeah we're gonna have you back have we talked about what the next film you're gonna be on for is uh no i feel like we might have i don't know where eagles dare i mean that's something that's coming at some point (gasps) obviously we're gonna cover that yes please (laughs) (laughs) we we did talk about the next one live and let die ah yes yes of course yeah anton he's gonna be on for live and let die killer soundtrack (laughs) oh yeah one of the best George Martin doing the score. Funky. Oh, my God. Yeah, we, yeah looking forward to that one. Jane Seymour, Yeah, that's right? going to be a lot of fun. I got a lot of thoughts on Live and Let Die. Wings. Heck, yeah, man. One of, if not the best, of the Bond theme songs. But, uh, yeah, anyway, we're going to be back next week with another episode of Why Wasn't It Better. Anton, do you know what it is? Yes. So, uh, next week, we are actually going to... Uh, well, we, we we just touched on Bond, but um, it's a it, it's a it's a film in the Bond series that made quite a different direction. It was after saying goodbye to Sean Connery and saying hello to a very emotional installment in the 007 series. We won't say what it is, but you can probably guess. And we will see you then on why wasn't it better? Take care, everyone. Yeah.